With that, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. Title of our study this morning, Every Good and Perfect Gift. For any who might be newer to a study of 1 Corinthians, the Corinthian church was a church that was blessed in every possible way. But they had a couple problems, one of them being they were carnal and immature. And so throughout the letter from chapter 1 all the way to the end, Paul is dealing with doctrinal issues and moral issues and ethical issues. And, well, these guys were loved by the Lord. They loved the Lord, but they were very immature. And so they had trouble rightly representing the Lord. Well, the section we've been considering, chapters 12, 13, and 14, deal with the reality of our spiritual calling, that we've all been called to full-time ministry, that we're all gifted for full-time ministry. By the way, that ministry is at home, it's at work, it's at school, it's at play, it's wherever we are. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We're his representatives. So Paul shows us. He's fashioned and formed us. He's made us a part of the body. We saw that in the latter part of chapter 12. Then last time he talked about the mo most important spiritual enablement, and that's the ability to love biblically, as he showed us not just the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now in chapter 14, he deals with an issue of carnality and immaturity that was plaguing them, where they were valuing one gift over another. And sadly, they were valuing the only gift that could only benefit them and no one else over well, the gifts that benefited and blessed everyone else. Let me begin with the question, though. What's better, a bowl and spoon or a plate and fork? I would suggest you can't answer that question unless you know what the meal is. If it's soup, I think the bowl and spoon are going to work better. If it's steak, you're going to need the plate and the fork and probably a knife. Hopefully not one of those plastic knives they give us here for the men's fellowship. I feel like they don't trust us or something. But the point is, each of those are perfect for the meal they were created for. And when it comes to spiritual gifts, if you would ask the Corinthians, what's a better gift, the gift of tongues or the gift of prophecy. They go, ooh, 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 I know tongues. Why? Well, it's so supernatural. But all the gifts are supernatural. Yeah, but it, it just makes me feel so good. Yeah, but all the gifts make us feel good. Here's the point. If you're new to all this, if you don't know anything about tongues, if you don't know anything about prophecy, we'll define those in a minute. But my goals are threefold as we walk through this chapter together. First, we want to consider what's revealed. Because this is one of those areas where there are so many misconceptions. Most of them will be dealt with just by reading what's here. The second area then will be to correct misconceptions related to tongues or prophecy or the use of any spiritual gift. Third, we want to commit to obey all commands. And that's because chapter 14 actually begins with three commands. Pursue love desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Priority one in the Christian experience is to pursue love. Now, he's not just talking about trying to find someone to love you. You already have that. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus so loved that he gave his life. So, we have someone who loves us. He's saying pursue loving, really. Pursue being a, the downline, a distributor of the love that God has shown you. That word for desire, spiritual gifts, is the word from which we get our word zeal or zealous. And so he's saying priority one is pursue love at all costs. Second thing is make sure you're, well, desiring, passionately, zealous, for spiritual gifts. And the third is proclaim his will. Proclaim his word. He says, especially that you may prophesy. That's exactly what prophesying is. It's declaring the word of God. 
Now, the prophets in the Old Testament, they got direct revelation from God. That can still happen, by the way. But we have the whole Old Testament. We have the whole New Testament. And while God could just pop some new thing into my head, he's called me to teach what I'm absolutely sure is from him. And that's his word. And that's really what he's called all of us to to be doers of the word, students of the word, doers of the word, and then sharers of the word of God. Now he's going to contrast prophecy in tongues because we know prophecy is going to benefit and bless, well, we'll find out, every other person. Tongues is a benefit and a blessing to the one who has that gift but fails to benefit and bless others unless there's an interpretation of the tongue. He says in verse 2, and we'll explain it, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, this is critical, that, that everything that Paul says is important, but if we don't get this, well, then we'll never really resolve a lot of the conflicts that have arisen around this particular gift. If you have the gift of tongues, he says, you will be using it to praise, to adore, to worship. In other words, tongues is always God word. Prophecy, on the other hand, is always man word. We don't declare God's word to him. We declare God's word to one another and to the world around us. So one gift is meant to worship. And it's perfect to enhance that worship. The other is meant to witness. And it's perfect in enhancing our witnessing. Now, the gift of tongues came about on the day of Pentecost. Many of you familiar, perhaps not all of you. 120 believers gathered together in an upper room. They'd been told to wait till the Spirit filled them. Then they could go out and be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. People from all over were gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. The 120, they hear a sound as of a mighty rushing wind. Cloven tongues of fire sit over each of their heads. Man, I wish I could have been there for that. It'd be like, whoa, you, got a you have fire over your head. They go, you got it too. Because see, you can't see what's over you. But you could notice everybody's got this going on. And then all of a sudden, they start to all speak in languages. Don't miss this. Languages they'd never learn. Now, down below in the streets, because they're in an upper room, there are Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and people from Mesopotamia, and they hear these disciples in the upper room proclaiming the wonderful works of God. What are they doing? They're worshiping, they're praising, they're adoring the Lord, and they're doing it in languages they never learned, but the languages of the people below. So major area of misconception is, first of all, that tongue somehow is for preaching. So we don't need it anymore because we have the whole word of God to preach. It was never for preaching. It was for praising. It was, is, will always be for praising the Lord. It is directed upward, not outward. Now, here's the other thing. Peter stands up and provides a scriptural basis for what was taking place. He says, these guys aren't drunk, as you suppose, because some were like, oh, they're, they must be drunk. Listen, I worked in the bars for eight years, and uh, I got to tell you, I heard people stammer and stutter and slur their words, but I never heard them speak languages they didn't know. Uh, you know, they spake some words I wish I hadn't heard, but, but he, no, this is a notable miracle, and for some reason, some are like, oh, they must be drunk. I'm like, what's wrong with those people? But, but Peter stands up and says, this isn't what you think. This is that spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he begins to quote from the Old Testament, explain what was taking place, and then in a language known to all of them, he preached the gospel. The outcome, 3,000 people were saved. 3,000 people baptized. 3,000 people continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. God multiplied this little fellowship of 120 into 3,120. But he didn't do it because these people experienced a miracle in an upper room. 
did it because somebody preached the gospel in a language everyone understood. Well, there is one other issue before we press on. If you have a King James Bible, I'm teaching out a new King James. I prefer it. Well, I've always preferred it. Even before they had it, I was trying to do it myself. I was a youth pastor at the time, and all there was was King James, and, and, and I'd say thiseth and thoueth and, and stuff like that, and the kids would snicker, and I'm like, man, i got to get away from this. So I'm like, blessed is the man who walks not, not walketh not, because this sounded like I was saying something silly. And so... So I started just altering it just enough to make it sound the way we talk today. Walks not, stands not, sits not. And the point is this, that, that, well, King James translates in this passage, wherever tongues is mentioned, unknown tongues. Some came to the conclusion because they read that and thought, okay, so these are languages that aren't known anywhere. No, nothing could be further from the truth. Their languages, they're just unknown to the person who's speaking in them. Now, the first question I had as a young believer when I heard about all this and read it is like, well, if I don't know what I'm doing, how will it bless me? Because he says you build yourself up and bless yourself by praising him and worshiping in tongues. Well, I figured this out over the years. Well, what I figured out is I don't have to know how something works for it to work. I ate breakfast this morning. I'm not a nutritionist. I don't exactly understand how that food's going to break down and nourish me, but I'm confident it will. And, and the same thing is true spiritually. If God says, here's something for you, and some people are like, oh, we got to all do that. And other people are like, oh, we don't want to do that. And then it's like, well, if it's from him and it's a good and perfect gift, as all gifts are from God, well, then we don't want to be afraid of it and we don't want to be obsessed with it. We just want to say, Lord, if you have this for me, well, I I want what you have. I I want all you have. So the question I had is, well, how will I know if I'm built up or encouraged? It says that that I'll be, uh, you know, built up and encouraged. But but how will I know? Well, I know because he says so. Isn't that, in fact, how we know we're saved? I mean, if somebody asks you, are you sure that you're really saved? Are you really a Christian? And you affirm, absolutely. Well, what proof do you have? Well, I have a changed life. I know people at AA, they could say, who have a changed life. They don't even claim to be Christians. So can a changed life be enough? Oh, there needs to be a changed life. But the reason I know I'm a Christian is he says, if I trust in him, he'll save me, forgive me, seal me, secure me. And someday I'll stand before him in heaven and hear, well done, and enter in. I have all that because he says so. That's all I have is his word. Well, here's the thing. He goes on in verse 3 to say, He who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So the one speaking in a tongue speaks to God, not to men. It's a mystery. But if you prophesy, if you speak forth the word of God, well, you're edifying, exhorting, and comforting other men. Now, again, he's not contrasting a bad gift with a good gift. All God's gifts are perfect. Tongues, perfect for worship. Prophecy, perfect for witnessing, sharing the word. Tongues enable someone to worship supernaturally in languages they never learned, but note they are, in fact, languages. Prophecy is the ability to proclaim God's word with authority, with clarity, with simplicity. The prophets in the Old Testament came saying, thus says the Lord. Many of us today just say, it is written. But listen, prophecy has two legs, as it were. There's foretelling and there's foretelling. Foretelling would have to do with the future. I can do that right now. I can tell you that someday you are going to stand in one of two judgments. You will either stand in the judgment with the saints where all are welcomed in, well done, enter in, good and faithful servant, or you will stand in the great white throne judgment a thousand years later where unbelievers will be judged and cast in to Gehenna forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Now listen, I have that from the word of God. He doesn't have to give it to me directly, but... 
He promises, if I study, he'll bring to my remembrance the things he's taught me. It's no less prophesying that I'm declaring the future from the word than if God gave it to me directly. And not all prophecy, even in the word, has to do with the future. A great deal of it had to do with the immediate situation. The prophets of the Old Testament came saying, hey, repent. God told us not to get into idolatry. We need to repent. God said, don't get into immorality. We need to repent. And so the prophet spoke for the Lord to the people of God and to the unbelievers around them. Well, he used three words to describe what should happen when the word of God is shared. Edification, well, it means to build up. We get our word edifice from the same root. So the idea is we're building up the body of Christ uh, as we share the words of Christ. Exhortation is a word that actually means to encourage. Sometimes we can think, oh, ex being exhorted, like, you know, the wag of the finger and the, 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 you know, hard look. No, exhorting is just encouragement. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Repent and, and God will will bless and forgive and, and, and change things. And, and so we're encouraging people to act upon the word of God. And then that word comfort, it means to calm, to console, or to cheer. And as I share the word of God, it's my fervent hope and prayer and expectation that all of those things are going to happen at least in some hearts. Now, he who speaks in a tongue, he says, verse 4, edifies himself, builds himself up. That's what God's saying. I believe it. Don't have to understand it. I just affirm it. He who prophesies edifies the church. Now, check this out. I only have his word on that too, but I have confidence that his word will do exactly what he says it will do if I'll just share his word as he's called me to. Now, Paul's personal preference, verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues or with tongues, unless he interprets that the church may receive edification. Key word here is greater. Because the Corinthians wanted to be greater. They were competitive. They wanted to stand out. And so they were thinking, man, that gift kind of makes me stand out. And Paul's saying, no, listen, the greater. And greater here actually comes from a word that means the elder or the mature. So the immature, the carnal, as we shared in past studies, saw God's gift as toys to play with. But the mature see them as tools to work with. And so he's saying the elder, the mature, realizes that speaking forth, proclaiming, declaring God's will and God's word, that is going to benefit and bless every person who hears and responds. So, so he's saying this is really the key issue. Now, he adds something else, and we need to at least touch on it. He says when someone speaks in an unknown tongue, and again, it's a tongue unknown to them, it's a language, but a language they don't know, and no one will be built up and blessed unless he interprets. Later, he'll mention, as he did earlier, that there may be someone else who interprets. Now, this would not be like Acts 2 in this sense. Say you had the gift of tongues and the language God gave you was French. And you spoke and you praised and worshipped God in French. And someone who spoke French said, oh, I know what you're saying because that's my language. That's what was happening in Acts chapter 2. But there wouldn't be a need for a spiritual gift of interpretation if it were just, hey, find someone who speaks the language. Head to Chico State. People are there from 150 nations. We'll find someone to interpret. No, we're talking about a spiritual gift of speaking in a language you don't know and a spiritual gift of interpreting that language even though you don't know it either. Well, if I come, he says, again, brethren, speaking to believers, speaking to the church, if I come to you, verse 6, speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. 
Now, here's another area of misconception. Some who have just, in people do it. I don't know why they do it. They'll pick a verse and they'll develop a theme and they'll make a whole message out of it and then there'll be a book and a movie and, you know, it just goes on and on. But he says, if I came speaking in tongues, how would I bless you unless someone interpreted or unless I spoke to you by revelation, knowledge, prophesying, or teaching? Some say, well, he's saying tongues can be revelation or knowledge or prophesying or teaching. But that would contradict what he said in verse 2. He says you're speaking to God, not man. So you're not teaching, you're not telling, you're worshiping. So what he's doing is he's contrasting that word unless means unless I did that and I did this. Unless I speak to you either by revelation. That's an unveiling, by the way. The book of Revelation is the opening up, the unveiling of who Jesus really is in all his glory. Knowledge is experiential knowledge. So Paul's saying, if I came and I didn't really reveal or I didn't really share my experience, my conversion, my transformation, the things God's taught me, if I didn't prophesy foretelling or forthtelling as we've already touched on, or teaching, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just trying to fill in the historical background, deal with some of the words themselves, point out there are key words, edification, verse 3, edifies, verse 4, edifies, verse 4 again, edification, verse 5. And, and so again and again, he's saying, whatever we're doing, we need to be building up because that's what it means to edify. Well, in any case, tongues, rather than revealing, can obscure my praise. Why? Because if I praise in a language everyone understands, they can say, oh, me too, Lord. I, I, I love you so much. You're so awesome. You're so wonderful. There's no one like you. And then, well, what about experience? Well, Speaking in a language people don't understand, and he's going to really make the case for this in a moment, that actually it, it, it can hide my experience. And in the same thing, it, it can fail to communicate God's nature or instruct people as to his will. Now, he uses some musical examples. He uses first in verse 7, even things without life, flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? He's saying if it's just random notes, we don't recognize the song. We don't recognize the melody. We can't join in. If it's just random, well, that's what my wife calls jazz. I happen to like jazz. She doesn't like it so much. But the point is, if it's not something we can recognize or participate in, well, then how would we know to say, hey, play that one again? And, uh, and we wouldn't see. And then he uses another example and has to do with preparing for battle. Important since, well, physical and spiritual battles in this world. If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? They had a specific little, you know, tune they would play to say, prepare for battle. There's another that they would play that said, attack. Another they'd play for retreat. He's saying if the trumpet plays an uncertain sound, that could be deadly. I don't know if I'm supposed to attack or if I'm supposed to retreat. So the trumpet needs to play exactly what we've learned it will communicate in order to tell us what we need to do. He likens that then in verse 9, having used those as illustrations. Likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. You know of Jesus, it said, the common people heard him gladly. You didn't have to be a religious leader. You didn't have to be able to read Hebrew. You didn't have to have the scrolls. You didn't have to be highly educated. You didn't have to be a scholar. You could just be a regular person and you could understand what Jesus was saying. And I've made it my goal to teach not just clearly but simply. 
Why? Well, I've heard people who are so complicated, I'm like, man, they must be smart. I don't understand a word they're saying. And, and I realized that while that's impressive, it's not fruitful. It's not useful. I need to hear and understand, and you need to hear and understand. So I would encourage you, when you're sharing, and I know many of you do, make your goal be not to impress them, but to connect with them, to be able to clearly communicate what's in the word and what's on your heart. Now he does go on in verse 10 to say, there are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world. None of them is without significance. Therefore, if I don't know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. That word foreigner is actually barbarian. And the Greeks considered anyone who didn't speak Greek a barbarian. A little bit of haughtiness and pride there, but that's just how they saw it. No, he's saying, here's the deal. The language, and there are many... Unless I speak the language, well, there's no connection. There's no real relationship. When I was relatively young, my parents started taking me to church. They took me to churches in the South, little Southern Baptist churches, where I learned there was a God who made me and loves me and has a plan for me. Then we moved, and, and we were on Air Force bases around the world, and, 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 uh, and, and so we went to Lutheran church, and we went to Episcopalian church, and, and I mean, we went to different types of churches. Then my parents divorced, and I went to live with my grandparents who didn't go to church, so I never went to church from uh, the time I was uh, in uh, sixth, seventh, or eighth grade. Then when I was in ninth grade, my mom came back and got me and my brother and sister and took us to Chicago, and uh, she had married a guy who was a Catholic. So I started going to church. Now, I don't share this, and, and I hope no one misunderstands. I don't share this to, like, you know, rag on the Catholics. I'm not anti-Catholic or down on Catholicism. But here was my personal experience, and it relates directly to the passage, and it's why I'm sharing it. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was needy. I was hurting. I was a 13-year-old kid who hadn't seen my dad for a while. I hadn't seen my mom for a while. Now I have this stepdad. Didn't really get along with him. They take me to church, and I'm like, at least I'll get some consolation here. Because when I thought church, I thought what I'd had. I thought especially those little Baptist churches where I was taught the word of God and taught to love the word of God and the God of the word. But I go into church, and it's in Latin. I can't tell you how disappointed I was because I truly, for, for probably the, the worst time of my life, needed somebody to speak straight up to me, tell me how things were, give me some hope, give me some consolation, give me some peace. And all I'm getting is a language I have no idea what they were saying. Well, Years ago, we had Japanese students. We did it for over a decade. We brought them, one year, 89 of them at once. But we brought all these Japanese students, and we put them in Christian homes for a month in the summer. Their parents sent them because they wanted them to learn English. They could read and write it, but they couldn't speak it. They needed to be uh, surrounded by it. Well, we had a motivation, too. We were very open about it. We want to share Jesus with your kids. We want them to know there's a God that loves them and, and you know, cares about them, and, and he's not sort of just ethereal and unknowable. He's real. And so in any case, we have these Japanese students, and one year we had this student, and, and, and some of them had a little English. Some of them spoke absolutely no English. So I, I'm trying to communicate with this little guy, trying to figure out what we can do with them, and I'm like... Uh, you like baseball? And my kids are like, they're not Indian, Dad. They're, they're Japanese, you know. Because for some reason, I thought if I left off some syllables, that would help, you know. You've done that silly stuff, right? You ever been somewhere and, and they don't speak the language, so you say it louder in English? Like, oh, they'll get it for sure now. But check this out. Josh looks at this little guy and he goes, base a balla. And, and I'm like, they're not Italian either, dude. And, and so the kid looks and he says, Basabala, yeah. And then Macadonardo after, you know. And, and, and so, but the point is, I don't know how or why he could understand Josh. And, they, and he couldn't understand me. Now, was it a spiritual gift? I don't think so. But, but I do know that 
I had no way to communicate with this little guy, and I really wanted to communicate, and, and so I had to get an interpreter in order to speak. Sometime back, we had Carlos come share here. Many of you know him. He pastors Amigo Fiel in Juarez, Mexico. He's also the, the uh, gatekeeper that, that brings the shoeboxes of Franklin Graham's uh, Samaritan's Purse into Mexico. They all come through him. Last year, 750000 thousand shoeboxes went into Mexico through Carlos. So he comes and he shares at our church and we have a lot of people who speak Spanish here. It's actually their native tongue but they speak English so like Carlos they're bilingual. He began the service addressing them in Spanish. Now I had no problem with that although I was a little worried. He could have been saying now look I know you put up with this Pastor Sam week after week but now you got me so it's going to be a good Sunday. I don't think that's what he was saying, but I was appreciative of the fact that after he introduced himself and spoke in Spanish to the Spanish brothers and sisters, he spoke in English to the rest of us and told us exactly what he had said to them. And so my point, Paul's point, is simple. Unless we understand the language, we can't benefit or bless anyone with the language. And he again makes it clear, these tongues, they are in fact languages, all of them significant, all of them important, but we need to communicate at least when we're together in language we can understand. Even so, he says in verse 12, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, something he had exhorted them to be, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Again and again, he uses this word. Make sure you're building up your brothers and sisters in Christ. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Why? Because if there's an interpretation, then at least we can say, Amen. Me too, Lord. I love you too. I adore you. I honor you. I praise you. Just like my brother here. And so if I pray in a tongue, he says, my spirit prays but my understanding is unfruitful. Hey, here's a clue to the fact of how I could be blessed. I'm blessed in the spirit, you see. Well, he says, what's the conclusion then? And don't even get, you know, thinking this is his conclusion or mine. For some reason, you know, he's a pastor guy. He's like, hey, let's make a conclusion. No, he means only to this thought. I will pray with the spirit. I'll pray with understanding, I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For indeed you give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So again, bless God word, giving of thanks, giving of thanks, but no one else can say amen because they don't know what you're saying. Now, Paul sort of surprises them, I believe, when he says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. There are some who say, well, tongues were just for the first century, as was prophecy, as was knowledge, but really all those things are necessary and useful today, but in the context that God has given in Scripture. So Paul's saying, and maybe some were surprised by it, maybe they didn't even know he had the gift of tongues. It's my personal belief that this is a gift Paul exercised privately, not publicly. And you'll see why as we go further in. But he says, um, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. It's the strongest statement thus far. I'll give you five words God's given me, and I share them at every service. Jesus died for our sins. If you haven't given your life to the Lord, that's the message that can change everything. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. Those five words have changed my life and so many other lives here. If you're a Christian and you're struggling or stumbling, 
Jesus died for our sins, not just our past sins, our present sins, our future sins. There's forgiveness if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whatever our situation, those five words change things. But 10,000 words in a language you don't understand, all it would make you is crazy. Or make you think, I'm crazy, and he's going to mention that in a minute. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. He's exhorting them to grow up. Immature, carnal, he's saying it has to change. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. Now, verse 21 has been misunderstood, as much of this passage has, mostly because people don't read the verses in light of the chapter, they don't read the chapter in light of the section or the section in light of the book or the book in light of the Bible. And the broader the context, the, the greater hope of understanding. But the immediate context is always absolutely essential. So look at verse 21. In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. Yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Now what he says in verse 22 is going to seemingly contradict what he says after. So the key is verse 21. What's he saying? It's in the law. So he's pointing us back in the Old Testament. With men of other lips, other tongues, I'll speak to this people. Yet for all that, they will not hear me. He's talking about the prophets coming to his people saying, repent. God told us not to get into idolatry. He told us not to do the things that the Canaanites did in this land. He told us not to get into immorality. He's calling us to repentance. And what he's saying is that, that if they didn't repent, and he told them in the law, he reemphasized uh, re it through the prophets, and then it happened that they would go into captivity, that he would bring an enemy. He brought the Assyrians. They didn't understand the language, but they understood they were captives. They understood they were going into captivity. Then he brought the Babylonians, the same deal. And so here's what he's saying. The law says, I'm going to use men you don't understand to deal with you. And even for that, you will not hear me. Therefore, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. He's talking about the unbelieving in his people who continue in their sin, even though he told them, judgment's going to come, and I'm going to use those you don't even understand to judge. But, he says, prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. How so? The prophet said, repent and he'll forgive. And some repented. They believed, and forgiveness followed. Therefore, and this is where it would be a contradiction if we didn't understand the historical context. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in among those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? See, he just said those tongues were for the unbelieving, but he was talking about his people that face judgment. Now he's talking about a fellowship, a church service. And most of their fellowships were small. They were more like a large home fellowship. And, and that's important to know as well as we uh, press on and, and look at the rest of what he has to say here. So he says, if you're together and you all speak in tongues together, someone comes in who's uninformed, doesn't really know what you're talking about or what you're doing, or you're, they're an unbeliever, they're going to think you're out of your mind. By the way, he already said that should never happen. He's going to say in a moment, it's a preview, uh, if anyone speaks in a tongue, one at a time, two or three at the most, never without interpretation. There has to be interpretation. Otherwise, there's no, and you already know, edification, right? Now, some are going to say, because I've had the question, I'll address it, save you the trip up, what about the 120? Yeah, they all spoke in tongues together. Yes, they did. And that was a notable miracle, and it was God doing it. By the way, they had no clue what was going to happen. They couldn't reproduce any of that. It's not like those cloven tongues of fire were going to show up again or the rushing mighty wind. They were given a gift, though, and they would be able to 
praise the Lord in languages they never learned. So, so here's the point. What he's saying is, is that, well, just because something happens in the scripture, we need to go to the passages that tell us what God wants us to do. And, and listen, whether it's a bad thing or a good thing, I'm saying the 120 could not be a better thing. God poured out his spirit. It was evidenced by miracles, preaching of the gospel. People got saved. That's all good. But you know that the Bible's clear on so many things, and it's what God says that defines what we do, not what we see. We can't go by their experience or our experience. We have to know what does God specifically say about this area. This, by the way, so important because you have two extreme camps when it comes to tongues. One camp says, man, everybody has to do it, needs to do it. There's actually a small part of the Pentecostal movement. The, uh, you know, anyway, in this very small part of it, they say, unless you speak with tongues, you're not even saved. They base that on, if any man hath not the spirit of God, he's not his. That's actually a true statement. But the idea that tongues is the evidence that we're filled with the Spirit, listen, I would suggest the evidence that we're filled with the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Because people have gifts or could manufacture or imitate gifts even if they didn't, you know, have a, a relationship with God. So, so here's, here's the important issue. One group is saying, you got to do it. Another group saying, no, you should never do it. That's not for today. That was just for then. It's ended. It's done. And listen, both are in extreme position because there's really no basis scripturally to say, well, those gifts are no longer necessary or useful. And most of the misconceptions, if you get with the people that say, well, it was just for the first century, they say, well, we don't need to preach in tongues because we have the whole Bible now. No one ever preached in tongues. And even men, I greatly admire that if you say, hey, what's a good commentary on this book or that? I'd say, this guy's my favorite author. This guy is one of my favorite authors. These people do a great job. When it comes to this area, it seems like almost all the church, not all of it, but it's one of the few areas where there's such radical polarization. And the irony is, the gifts were given to bring us together, to bless us, to bring us closer to the Lord and make us more fruitful for the Lord. Well, again, what about the 120? God blessed them. They did it. That's fine. But he's telling us, if all prophesy or an unbeliever, verse 24, contrasting, or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He's convicted by all. Thus the secret of his heart is revealed, so falling on his face, he'll worship God and report that God is truly among you. Now, we're not really set up in our generation and in the nature of our church services for everyone to be able to say, thus says the Lord. But if you get involved in a home fellowship, which is highly recommended, there will be opportunity to say, I was reading in the Psalms today, and man, look what the Lord showed me. Or I was reading in Genesis today, and I was just so blessed by this. And, and so it's possible in a setting like that, or sometimes our Saturday nights or our Wednesday night services will take 10 minutes after the worship prior to the teaching, and, and we'll just praise the Lord. We do it one at a time. We do it loud enough for everybody to hear. And then we're like, me too, Lord, thank you. You've been so good. You've blessed our family. You've blessed our fellowship. And, and then there's prayer. And we're able to say, oh, Lord, please answer that prayer for her child or for, for his, his wife or, or for our friends. And, and so the point is, it is possible for, for everybody to do what he's saying. But you have to consider the context. And he's going to say, we want to make sure that whatever we're doing, people are built up, people are encouraged, people are edified. Well, again, he, he, he says, uh, and, and, and listen, if somebody came in and everything they heard was from the word of God, and they're like, man, God is here. That's success. That's what he's saying. They'll worship God and report he's truly among you. How is it, brethren? Verse 26, Whether, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Now, 
Some here see a perfect church service. Others see carnal Christians seeking attention. I see both. I see the potential in a smaller setting for people to get together and, and for all of the things that can happen to happen. But the deal is if, like the Corinthians, we were like, I want people to notice me. Then we're not going to be thinking about how I can bless them. We're going to be thinking about how I can get attention. And that's exactly what he's dealing with with them. I can still see, though, the benefit of a gathering where someone reads a psalm or just shares a psalm and someone teaches and, and someone speaks in a language unknown. But if that were to happen, there has to be interpretation. He's going to say so again and again. Someone with the revelation, someone with an interpretation. Either way, the goal has got to be edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, verse 27, let there be two or th at the most three, each in turn. This again says it should never happen as it does in some settings where everybody's speaking in tongues together. One at a time, each in turn, two or three at the most, and let one interpret. Then he says, if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So he deals with two major issues, two areas of misconception that everyone can do this together and that interpretation is unnecessary. And the idea that I've heard expressed at least is that, well, this isn't that tongues. This is a different tongues. I'm like, well, where's the different tongues in the Bible? This is God describing what happened back then and explaining how it needs to happen if it's going to happen today. Now, he doesn't just single out tongues. He says, even if two or three prophets were to speak, let two or three prophets speak. So again, even though it's possible for everyone to have opportunity to share, he's saying, make sure that two or three people are sharing the word of God and let the others judge. The others here would be the elders, the responsible men in that little group to say, Hey, right on, or that, that I got to tell you, that's unbiblical or, or not right. And if you do a home fellowship, someone will share something that you're like, oh my gosh, how do I deal with this? It happens. And, and so uh, the, the thing is, is if you open your home and, and you're, you know, going to share the word of God and you're going to have people in and someone comes and shares something that just ain't so, you need to lovingly share, listen. And, and I, I, I do this in a really casual way because I, I thought so many stupid things in my life, almost without exception, I could say, you know, I used to think that too. And, uh, but, but I was uninformed. I hadn't studied. I hadn't read. The Bible actually says, and then you just lovingly share what's true. You don't have to embarrass them. But if they shared their ignorance in public, you need to correct it in public. You can't just take them aside later and let everybody leave thinking, whoa, that was kind of cool when it wasn't cool. And so the ones judging here, this is important because in a minute he's going to say something that if you don't get the context, some of you aren't going to be all so happy to hear it. So let two or three speak. Some of you read ahead, obviously. And let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. So with tongues or prophecy, he's giving the parameters of how those gifts should be used. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. He's saying there's no time it should be out of control because God isn't the author of confusion and out of control is chaos and confusion. Years ago at my home church, Calvary Costa Mesa, right in the middle of Pastor Chuck's teaching, a guy stood up with the guitar. Now you got to picture this. This is a relatively small church comparatively. There are 3,000 people crammed in this service. A guy stands up, Pastor Chuck's teaching. The guy just starts singing and playing his guitar and People were hard looking him and that didn't work. And then the ushers came and that didn't work. So they carried him out screaming. And, and, uh, and then they get him and they're like, what's the matter with you? What were you doing? He goes, I don't know. I just felt like the spirit moving for me to share a song. While Pastor Chuck's teaching? That's inconceivable. 
And, and he's like, well, it was, I just, I couldn't control myself. So then the question is, well, are you even a Christian? Because the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. If you're a Christian, the fruit of the spirit is self-control. We can control ourselves and must. So listen, if you got a song, you'd like to share it with us, come up in between the services, say, hey, I write songs, I'd be happy to listen. We don't do a lot of that, but if it's a song and it applies and it fits and it could be a help, we'll consider it. But please, never stand up while I'm teaching or while we're worshiping and say, hey, everybody, listen what God gave me. Because it's just out of order. Well, here's the thing. Spirits of the prophets, subject to the prophets. God doesn't want confusion. He wants peace in all the churches of the saints. Now, I told you some of you weren't going to like this next part, but let me explain what it really means, and you'll be okay. Let your women keep silent in the churches. Some people would just do a whole sermon on that. No context, no broadening. Let's just not have women keep silent. By the way, that would not even be possible, would it? I mean, let's be honest. No, listen. Now I'm in trouble, and I knew I would do that. No, listen. You gals are keeping quiet, and I appreciate that because this setting is for what I've been called to do, to teach and, and preach the word of God, to share the gospel. And, and so here's the thing. When he says here, let the women keep silent in the churches, they're not permitted to speak. They're to be submissive, as the law says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. It is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Listen, the context is immediate. He said, let two or three prophets speak, verse 29, let the others judge. Who are the others? I already told you, it's the elders. And so what he's saying is, as the prophets, as the word is shared, that the women aren't to chime up and say, hey, that's wrong. Just let your husband deal with it, or let the pastor, or let the elders deal with it. We know that women were allowed and are allowed to share and to pray because back in chapter 11, he gave the parameters for that. He said a woman shouldn't praise the Lord or pray in church or prophesy in church unless her head was covered, which was a sign of her submission. And, her, and, and so he already said it can and does happen. He said, but like this. Now he seems to be saying it can't happen. That can't be right. So you see the immediate context. You look at the broader context. And we know on our Saturday night and our Wednesday night prayer times that, that women share many beautiful and profound things. And Pam reads and does her devotions and sometimes shares things with me that are so insightful. And, and, and so I can learn from her, and I do. But he's talking about order in the church. He's talking about the church that's modeled after the home where the husband is to be the head of the household, take responsibility for the family. Not because a woman couldn't, but because God didn't create her to do that. So he goes back to creation and to the origin of all of it. Did the word of God come to you originally? Or was it only you that it reached? Then if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Now, he's not saying if someone doesn't know anything, don't try to reach him. He's saying if they refuse to listen, if they refuse to learn, well, there's nothing you can do about it. Leave them in the state. That's your only option. And by the way, some translate this, let him be ignored, which is wisdom as well. If someone's like foolish and they don't want to know the truth, then, then it's like, you know what? Lovingly, you're ignorant. I'm going to ignore you. I still love you, but, you know, not going to listen to you. So anyway, I don't know if there's a real loving way to say that, but that, that's kind of what he's saying. Therefore, brethren, his conclusion and mine as well, desire earnestly to prophesy. It's a command. It's an exhortation. We should all want to share the word of God because everyone needs to know the word of God. It did not forbid to speak in tongues because that gift can bless people and it could bless any of us if God gives it to us. Let all things be done decently and in order. Lord, 